Deadly Premonition 2, A Blessing in Disguise has a lot to live up to. Ten years in the making, it's a sequel to one of the most critically mixed yet beloved cult games ever released on console. In short, many hated it, but those who loved it, really loved it. Even I found myself charmed by the game's unique vision and strangely lovable characters. The game's unintended weirdness and faults, while annoying at times, were a big part of its overall appeal. I described it as what you might get if Tommy Wiseau made a video game, along with some blatant David Lynch influence. It didn't seem like something that could be made on purpose, but against all odds, the creator, Swery, decided to make another. Let's see how that turned out. Monkey. Just a warning, while most of Deadly Premonition 2 is a prequel, significant portions do take place after the first game. I'll try to avoid spoilers as much as I can, and I'm not going to dive deep into the late game story, but we will touch on some scenes that take place in the future. The game opens with the chopped up body of a young woman being discovered in a block of ice, before segueing to Boston, Massachusetts, where a pair of bickering FBI agents, the no-nonsense Aaliyah, and the pizza-obsessed desk worker Simon are on the job. As it turns out, the person that they're seeking to question is a much different looking Detective Morgan from the first game. Only 10 years have passed, but he looks about 40 years older, and he's acting very strange, which is saying a lot for him. Aaliyah presses Morgan on the 2010 Greenville case, which took place in the first game, but also goes on to mention the frozen girl that was discovered in the Deep South. As it turns out, she was connected to a case Morgan had been involved in back in 2005, in the town of Lepare, Louisiana. This is where the bulk of the game takes place. Much like the first game, Detective Morgan, sorry, I mean York, finds himself solving a string of murders happening in a small town. He's helped by the local sheriff and his young daughter who decides to become York's honorary partner, following him around wherever he goes, until it's past her bedtime. From here, the game plays quite the same as the original. York must traverse the town to different hotspots where he can search for clues and question the town's many bizarre yet entertaining characters. You have David, the owner of the hotel whose split personalities make up its small staff. The Sheriff Melvin, a lovable goofball who likes to talk in a dramatic movie narration voice. And it's all within their grasp. And then there's Mrs. Carpenter, a superstitious old bowling fanatic who refuses to let anyone else use the town's single bowling lane, which happens to be located inside of a diner. That's just the tip of the crazy cast of characters, and since the majority of the game is spent on scenes interacting with them, it's good that they're so entertaining. This time, instead of a car, York gets around using a skateboard. This is arguably an improvement since you no longer need to worry about running low on gas or a vehicle health bar until later anyway. You can even learn tricks as you progress through the game. Besides this, there's a quick travel taxi service that makes those areas farther out of town much easier to access. I like that this is blatantly shown to you during the game's normal progression, and I'd call it an improvement over the first game, where the quick travel was only obtainable through a very specific side mission that requires an exact set of circumstances to achieve. I didn't even know about it during my playthrough. Occasionally, you'll find yourself in this spooky nightmare dimension where you'll have to blast your way through voodoo demons to find yet more clues to the dark secrets going on in town. The shooting segments were the weakest part of the first game, in my opinion, so I really hope they'd improved on it this time around. In some ways they did. There's a larger variety of enemies to deal with, with more unique designs than just the crab walking zombies. These segments also feel like they don't drag on quite as long as they did in the first game, which was my main issue, though further in the game they do start to get pretty lengthy too. Thankfully they're not as prevalent overall. While most of the gameplay beats are pretty similar, a big difference here are the flash-forward scenes. Each chapter of the game starts with a lengthy interrogation scene between the detectives and Morgan, with you playing as Aaliyah as she attempts to dig into the retired FBI agent's brain. These are around an hour long each time, and the gameplay here involves selecting different objects or people in the room to try to make progress in the investigation. These parts almost resemble a visual novel style of gameplay, and when I said each chapter starts with this, that includes the first one. That means a full hour of minor interaction and dialogue before you even get to playing as York. 
This isn't necessarily bad, as the story and dialogue are the best parts of Deadly Premonition, and seeing an older and crazier Morgan like this is probably enough to keep fans going, but this is quite an abrasive opening to deal with for someone who might be diving into the series for the first time. I think it's safe to say that Swery is a madman. The town of Lakar gives Deadly Premonition 2 a very different aesthetic from the first. Greenville was a lush mountain town with lots of trees and natural space between the different homes and hot spots that you'd visit throughout, giving lots of time for York and Zack to have casual chats with each other during their drives. Lakare has a more standard small town feel to it, with more dense neighborhoods. The blaring sun and swampy surroundings are always there to remind you, however, that you're in the deep south. While it might feel weird to have such a jarring change of environment, I think this works to the game's benefit, making it stand out not only from the first, but also from the obvious Twin Peaks inspiration. I think each town has its own unique charm. Now let's really get down to it and talk about some of the game's flaws. A lot of people are already aware of this, but it must be said, the game has some serious frame rate issues, particularly when you're outside in the world sandbox. To clarify, I'm not someone who goes crazy over games that can't hit 60 FPS or whatever. A basic 30 is fine by me, and even if it does drop in places, I'm usually not bothered. This, however, is just inexcusable. The frame rate outside is consistently horrendous, just struggling to keep up with the gameplay. It also takes a full minute to load every time you exit a building, which you'll be doing a lot. This is something that I'm able to deal with, but I'm sure this would be a deal breaker for many players. The game actually straight up crashed once on me when it was trying to load the outside area, but thankfully the game has tons of auto saves which should keep you from losing much progress. Worse than this, however, was the time that the game had me stuck in a soft lock loop. You want to know how that happened? Listen to this. So in order to progress in one of the game's main missions, I was tasked with getting a can of red beans and rice. The only thing is that the one diner in town who has it only serves it on Mondays, and it was a Wednesday. Since passing time with the cigarettes here would be inefficient, you're forced to head back to the hotel and basically sleep five days in a row. Keep in mind, after only one day of sleep, York is starving, which means you're gonna have to make sure you have plenty of food on you. Also, for each day that passes, the hotel charges you, even though York explicitly says how great it is that the FBI is paying for everything. Anyway, more importantly than that, there's a hygiene meter that empties out after you do all that sleeping. And soon enough, there's flies buzzing around you. This was a funny little detail that was in the first game too, but in this one, you actually have to take a shower to clean up instead of simply changing your outfit. So, I skip ahead to Wednesday, eat, go bankrupt, and I'm preparing to take a shower when suddenly it breaks. This sends you on what is supposed to be a side mission to fix the shower, which involves you talking to David and his three different hotel personas, and fixing pipes. The problem here is that unlike the first game, you pay a $50 fee for talking to people while you're smelling. That's fine, except for some reason. Whenever I talk to a second person after being charged this BO fee already, instead of charging me, the game would just stop accepting any of my inputs, soft locking me. Move. Oh, I can't move. The game freaking froze. None of the buttons are doing anything. And yes, every time I reloaded and tried again, it would softlock in the same exact way. Suddenly this fix the shower side mission had become mandatory. Except, I couldn't do it because you need to talk to the three Davids in order to fix it. And this mission spans multiple days by the way, because you can only talk to the different Davids at specific times of the day. Ah, uh, now I understand why this game auto saves so much. So sure enough, I pick an earlier save, I do the broken shower mission before I get so smelly the game starts crashing, and finally I'm able to skip ahead to Wednesday and get my red beans and rice. Now, there may be parts of this game and the original game where you need to skip time a bit in order to complete a mission, but at no other point can I ever recall having to sleep five days in a row and then all this mayhem happening as a result. Yeah, that was a mess. So, besides those game-breaking moments, how do I think this game stacks up to the original. Personally, I actually think it's a pretty solid sequel. Now wait, I'm not saying that everyone should try this game out. In fact, I'm sure most people aren't going to get it. The game has a lot of flaws, so people who are hoping to see an improvement from the original in that aspect, I think they're going to be disappointed. In terms of the gameplay, I think they did a good job cutting out a lot of the unnecessary fat, but not all of it. There's still some strange pacing and level design choices. The weird dimension shooting segments take up a little less time, but the environments they take place in are actually more repetitive than in the first game, and they still drag on in the later levels. But the gameplay isn't 
isn't really why Deadly Premonition has the cult following that it does, it's the story. In that regard, I actually think that Deadly Premonition 2 lives up to the original pretty well. The town has characters just as entertaining and crazy as in the original, and the story, for me, might have actually been more engaging this time around. Probably because after playing the first, I became more attached to York and Zack, and was invested in seeing more of them. There's plenty of twists and turns to keep you guessing, and don't worry, things get freaky. Also, York gets hints from a ghostly shaman who no one else can see or hear, so that's neat. As the story goes on, we even see how the case in Lakare connects with what happened in Greenville, which inspires many holy crap moments that I wouldn't want to spoil here. Oh, and did I mention that there's some crazy ass bosses in this game? Cause there are, and I love crazy ass bosses. So there's some bonus points there too. In the end, if you're wondering whether Deadly Premonition 2 is a step up from the original, it isn't. It's more like a step sideways. But I think hardcore fans who are legitimately into the story of Deadly Premonition will get a lot out of this. Some people are gonna love it, and some people are definitely gonna hate it. Whether or not that's what Suri intended. But doesn't that kind of make it the perfect sequel? I think it does. 